Good morning. Sun is coming out. Here's where I'm staying. It's kind of out there. There's uh, not much around. So we are in the town of Oatman and they have all these wild burrows that just roam this little teeny city. And I had to get out of the car. Oh my God, I'm kind of scared. Ooh, ooh, but they're so cute. But it's wild. Lord, I got broken toes. Be nice. Hi, hi. Oh my gosh. You're precious. Hello. Oh my God. This is the coolest thing ever. Oh shit, but you're kind of scaring me. Okay, okay, hi. Oh my God, you guys. Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> I can't even take it. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi, precious. Come see me. Come see me. Nobody's coming. Hi. How are you? How's your day? You're beautiful. This is killing me. It's beautiful, but it's killing me. I don't like this road. Ah. But it's gorgeous. So this is the little teeny town of Oatman. There's the post office and the ride getting to here, let me tell you, was insane. All them switchbacks and drop-offs, the edge, I didn't appreciate any of it, but I'm here, guys. And look, $2 to park in the lot, and then they tell you, just put the two dollars in the barrel. <laughs> oh, what a cool little town! I love the little stagecoach. Sorry if I'm shaking, guys, but I got broken toes and I'm trying to walk. So, oh, that's so cute. And this is the whole town. <laughs> this literally is the whole town. They say like 70 something people live here and that's it. So cool. And look guys. The burrows, they're everywhere. I'm so excited. It's just wild donkeys. There's tons of them. This is the cutest little. It's an old mining town. Outlaw Willies. I'm gonna have to go in there. There's an actual saloon. I love it here. Just walking around. Unbelievable. Huh? It's just one little strip. <laughs> Hi. Oh. You're so sweet. 
you are. You are so cute. Oh, I'm not impressed. <laughs> he said no. The people said no. No. Not wanted. <laughs> They got saddles everywhere. This is just the cutest little town ever. <laughs> Get the little shops. What a cool place. I'm trying not to fall down with my bad foot. Uh-uh. That store is called the Classy Ass. <laughs> Wind chimes. Hey, buddy. You know what this bag is, don't you? Hi. Okay then. Help. Look at that. All the stage coaches. And that's Olive Oatman up there on the hotel side. And she was supposed to be kidnapped by the Indians for five years and got brought back. So good story. You guys look it up. I want to live in a town where donkeys just roam around. <laughs> Living his best life. So cool. Dollars. Maybe I have So cool. Just money. This is the coolest little saloon ever.
Hey, hello, howdy, folks, and welcome to Oakland, Arizona. Here in a few minutes, we're going to be doing a gunfight right out here in the street. First, we're going to fire off a shot. Better than me tell them we're getting ready to do something. So if you've got sensitive ears, you might want to cover them because sometimes they're louder than we think they're going to be. You just never know what the air pressure between these buildings is going to be like. So watch your ears because here goes. <laughs> All right. Now, here in a few minutes, we'll need some help blocking the road because we don't mind getting shot, but we do hate getting run over. We'll need some help here in a few minutes, but first, we're going to tell you a little bit about Oakland. Now, Oakman is a gold mining camp, not a town. It was never incorporated in the state of Arizona. It only exists out here in these mountains because of gold. Gold mining started out here as early as 1865. The Moss Mine sits about two miles off on Silver Creek Wash. It was operated from 1865 to 1942. But the gold that actually started the town of Oakman and the boom of Oakman would not be found until 1895, the first time around. In 1895, a man by the name of John Whiteley was following Beale's Trail, which ran from Santa Fe, New Mexico to Los Angeles, California. And it went through these mountains about a half mile up the road from here. Fall, uh, to, right next to uh, a spring up there called Schaefer Spring. Now, he was following that trail when he realized there was a quartz vein over the side of the mountain. He went to investigate, realized there was gold in that quartz, so he went back to Cayman and stuck a claim on it. Came back out with his tools to work his claim, and somewhere along the line, either two men stumbled across him while he was out there working on it, or they followed him out from Cayman, realizing he found something. But in any case, they all stood over the top of that gold before it was all said and done. The two guys figured they were going to take it from him. He decided that wasn't going to happen. So they all ended up in a gunfight. Before it was all said and done, they were all three killed. So the gold was lost for another four years. Now, four years later, in 1899, a man by the name of Jose Jerez was grub staked by Henry Loving just to get him out of Kingman for a while. Jose had been a colonel in the Mexican military, but by the time he got to Kingman, he was just a heavy drinker and kind of bothersome guy. So they'd grub stake him just to get him out of town. <coughs> they sent him out along Beale's Trail and somewhere on the top of Sit Creek's Pass, which is about five miles up the road from here. In his telling the story, he fell asleep and his burrows wandered off right in the middle of the night. Most people knew him really well, said so he more likely just got drunk, passed out, and forgot to tie his burrows down. But in any case, the next day, when he went to go find those burrows, they were standing right next to the quartz vein that Whiteley had put a claim on four years earlier. He went back to Kingman, stuck a claim on it with Henry Loving. They came out and they worked their claim for about six months. They got about a thousand yards in the ground before they realized they didn't have the manpower nor the money to get it up in operation the way it needed to be done. So they turned around and sold the whole thing to United States Steel. For today's money, about a million and a half dollars. Now Henry Loving went on to be a very prosperous businessman and died a very wealthy man. Jose, on the other hand, took all his money and went to San Diego, spent it all on whiskey, women, and having a good time. It lasted him a couple of years until he ran out of money, so he came back to Gold Road Mine and started working as a roustabout. He would work there for a couple of years until his alcoholism did him in. In his alcoholic delirium, he decided the reason he was losing all of his weight had absolutely nothing to do with drinking too much. He figured because something crawled down his stomach in the middle of the night was eating everything he was eating so he wasn't getting any nourishment. Well, he also figured he didn't to solve this problem, so he mixed himself up a rat poison cocktail and drank it down. Yeah, he killed the rat all right, but he also killed himself, and now he's buried three miles up the road in the Gold Road Cemetery. Now, that story was written up in the Kingman, Oatman, and Mineral Park newspapers back in the early 1900s. From 1901 to 1942, Oatman was the most populated place in Mojave County, which by area is the fifth largest county in the United States. Today it would be Havasu or Kingman, but back then it was Oatman with a population of, at most, a lot of the times, well over 10,000 people. And between 1910 and 1918, there were actually estimates there could have been as many as 40,000 people out here in the mountains around us, all looking for gold. This was the place to be. But in 1942, when World War II started, Roosevelt deemed that gold mining wasn't necessary for fighting World War II. He needed materials to fight the war with rather than gold, so he asked the miners to go mine other things. They did when they left, they took a lot of the infrastructure of Oatman out in order to fight World War II. Now when the war was over, everybody thought the mining was going to come back because most geologists believe they'd only taken a third of the gold out of these mountains. There's still two thirds of it still here. And from 1901 to 1942, they took an estimated 36 million ounces of gold out of these mountains. So that's only a third of it. But there's still a lot of gold out here somewhere underground. And in none of the veins that we know run through these mountains did anybody ever find anything really close to what they would be called, they would, in mining terminology, would be called the mother load or where the main source of the gold may have been coming from. They found several, uh, what they call bonanzas, which were just large pockets of gold. They found one in 1912 that was worth, at, at a, a price of $20 an ounce, was worth uh, about $15 million. So they have had a lot, found large park pockets out here, but they never found the mother load. So who knows how much gold might really be out here somewhere underground. But in case in 1942, the population opened, dwindled down to about 300 people. Those 300 stuck around, believing the gold mining was gonna come back when the war was over but it just never did. By 1951, when they realized it wasn't coming back anytime soon, they put in a bypass from Kingman to Needles going around the back side of these mountains in order to eliminate the windy road. When that got up and running, Oatman died and became a ghost town. It went from a population of, of uh, 300 down to three to nothing for the next 30 years. 
Now, Irwin would come back to a life, uh, some kind of life, in 1955 when Hollywood came up to film a movie called Foxfire. Again, in 1951 or 1957 when he came up to film the movie called How They, uh, called uh, Edge of Eternity. And again in 1961 when they filmed parts of the movie How the West Was Won. But other than that, it was pretty much a ghost town for the next 30 years. Now, it would not be until 1978 that I-40 would, or that uh, Oatman would really start coming back to life, and that was because I-40 ran right over the top of the bypass, went around in the mountain, right over the top. So, when that happened, if you wanted to stay on 66, and a lot of people were traveling down 66 at the time, you had to come through Oatman, through, uh, through Oatman, through the, by, through the bypass, again, if you wanted to stay on Route 66, what I call the Grapes of Wrath route. Anyway, so they started coming through and Oatman started to come back to some kind of life. Now it would not be until 1987 when Oatman would really come back to life because after 1987 they created an organization promoting Route 66 and small towns had been bypassed by I-40. When that got up and running, more more people started traveling down Route 66 again and that's when Oatman really came back to what you see today as a tourist town. Now there are, mining would not come back to these mountains until 1994, but the Gold Road Mine, which sits five miles up the road, or about three miles up the road actually, it's main mine. Started back in operation in 1994. It's been on and on off again in operation ever since, uh, more on than off. And the Moss Mine, which sits out on Silver Creek Walk, Silver Creek Road, uh, has been open ever, has been open and producing gold for the last 15 years. But uh, this town is all is nothing more than a gold. Uh, uh, it is not a, an incorporated town. It's simply a gold camp uh, built as a, as a community around gold mining and it's been a gold mining town ever since. Now the town originally started in 1901 as the town of Blue Ridge. Uh, the Indians used to call this small stretch of mountains the Blue Mountains because of the fact that in the evening as, as the sun goes up or comes down, they have, they have a murky blue tint to them. So when settlers started coming through these mountains, they called them, started calling them the Blue Ridge Mountains. So when they put the, found the first gold up here in this particular area, they put the post office here and they called it the town of Blue Ridge or the Blue Ridge uh, Mining Camp. So it, it, it started out as Blue Ridge in 1901 or 1900. But by 1901, they, they took all the, the five post offices that were scattered down a five mile stretch to there, necked them all down into one. They called that one post office the Blue Ridge Post Office because it sat right on top of the original Blue Ridge Post Office. But in 1909, a book got circulated to the town written by a girl named Olive Boatman. When that book got circulated to the town, miners read it, thought she's a pretty woman, gone through a really rough ordeal. There's a picture of her right up there. So they decided to change the name of town from Blue Ridge to Oatman. Now, most of the time, o Olive stayed with the, the, Maha the part of the Mojave tribe that was down near Parker. But by the time they changed the name of the post office, the Mojave tribe had been put on a reservation just down here on the river. So they just decided it was a good idea and they changed the name of the town from Blue Ridge to Oatman. It's been open in Arizona ever since. The massacre of the, of the Oatman family happened, happened 150 miles south of here down near Gila Bend. There's a concrete park marker where the attack took place and the Oatman's buried not too far away. Uh, everybody was killed out of a family of nine except for a young son named Lorenzo. He survived the attack but, uh, and was left for dead but survived the attack. Marion Open and Olive and Open were taken captive by the Yavapai Indians. They would spend a year, a year with the Yavapais and the Mojave Indians went and traded for them and got them out of captivity from the Yavapais because they wanted to treat them well so that if the, if the white man showed up again, they could say they were taking care of their people really well and they'd leave them alone. So they went down and they spent four years with the Mojave Indians years into that Marianne died of starvation but that was only because the Indians or even the Indians were starving out because there were extreme droughts between Colorado and Arizona in 18 between 1849 and 1856 so severe that many of those years the Colorado River was so low most of the time you could step from one side to the other and never get wet so they were having a hard time growing food and even the Indians were dying off all remained with the Indians until for another year until a Spanish trader realized it was a white girl with the Indians he went down to Yuma grabbed some folks they came up and bartered with the Indians and got her out of captivity once she was released, her and her brother got with the co-author, and they co-wrote a book called Captivity of the Open Girls. And that was the book that would change the name of the town from Blue Ridge to Oatman in 1909, and it's been open in Arizona ever since. But most of us who know the history of these mountains think this town ought to be called Bentner, because in 1858, the first wagon train to use the newly opened Beale Trail from Santa Fe to, to L.A. was the Rose Bailey wagon train. With them came a family of seven called the Bentners. Now, the Bentners, like the Opens, got separated from the wagon train they were running with, and shortly after that, they were massacred by the Mojave Indians. And that massacre happened just two miles from here, over by Silver Creek Spring. We know about this because of a book called Disaster, Disaster at the Colorado, but uh, we all believe it should be, well, a lot of us that know the history think it should be Bentner, but it's been open ever since 1909 and still is the day. All right. Uh, I just let the traffic go through here. 
Yeah, watch that burrow in particular. Grab your stuff and get it off the street and watch her because she's really sneaky about walking up behind you and stealing your bags. And she, well, she'll wait till we hit the roadblock and she's going to sneak up behind you. And if you've got a bag in your hand, she's going to take it. Good, not that truck come through. see live ammunition. We only use them uh, for these shows alone. We're Arizonans. we got plenty of guns to go out and shoot in the desert. Uh, but these we only use for doing the shows. They never see live ammunition. We use a little cornmeal and some gunpowder to make the noise. Other than that, we could shoot at each other six inches away and uh, you'd never, you know, six inches away we'd never feel them. And the big difference between us and Alec Baldwin is our guns never leave our side. We always know what's in them. We always know because they never leave our side. So we always know what's going on with these things. So anyway, you're perfectly safe out here with us. Now, we are the Red Ridge Marauders. We started up that name about eight years ago, just pick up slack. Some of the other gunfighting groups were having health problems, other issues weren't getting out here all the time. So here we come out here and have some fun of our own. I've been doing gunfights in this town for about 23 years. Two hats over here has been helping, uh, been doing them for about five years now. But we started on the name Red Ridge Marauders just to pick up the slack. Now, we do the same thing everybody else does. Gunfights have been going on in this town for about a little over, actually over 50 years now. Uh, Duke Clark started them back in the 70s, and uh, so they've been going on for quite a while. But we do the same thing everybody else does. We do, or all the gunfighting groups in this town have done through the years. We do it for entertainment, hope it brings you to town, give you something else to do other than feed the boroughs. But we also do it for charity. Now what we donate to in particular is St. Jude's Research Hospitals. And in the last eight years, and a lot of those eight years we were only doing these a couple times a week, and a year of that we didn't do anything at all. But we've done it pretty regular as the last couple of years, two or three years now. But anyway... Uh, in the last eight years, we've managed to donate $15,000 to St. Jude's Research Hospitals, thanks to the Golden Vortex Mining Company out on Silver Creek Wash. They donated $1,000 to St. Jude's last, us, last year to us, and with their help, we're now at $15,000. We've also donated $2,000 to Wounded Warrior, another $2,000 to some local charities. We donated $1,000 to a thing called Nazarene Fund to help get Americans out of Afghanistan, and we also helped the bathrooms out as well. Now, the way we do this is we're going to do a gunfight for you. And when we're done, we're going to humbly walk amongst you with our hats and our hands. In a real polite way, saying, please donate to our cause. And we got a real nice way of saying, please. Please. <laughs> Thank you. We appreciate it. It's a highway. This is robbery. You got it. Anything we don't use for powder and primers and things we need for doing the show, we donate somebody who needs it. Now, as I was saying, Oakland's a gold mining camp, not a town, but even a gold mining camp has to have a bank, and our bank is over there. Now, anytime you got a bank or an assay office full of gold, which is back over here, uh, you're going to need a sheriff to guard that gold. Fortunately for us, somebody shot that sheriff last week. <laughs> Was that you? Did you shoot that sheriff? It wasn't me. I shot a deputy. In any case, anytime you got a bank full of gold and no sheriff to guard it, you're going to have bad guys hanging out. It's gunfight time. Oh, one word of one word of statute. If we do hear an ambulance coming, we had an accident on Silver Creek. Don't think they'll be done by the time we get through the show. But uh, if they do show up, we do need to open it up, let them go by because they, there was an accident out there. So anyway, and it's gunfight time. Yeehaw! I tell you what, I've been hanging around in town for a week now, waiting for a stagecoach show up. Found me one yesterday. He showed up, had a couple bags of gold on him. But while he was sitting there unloading the gold, I was stuck in the outhouse with him. I couldn't get out of there. Somebody around this town's been hoarding toilet paper. There ain't no toilet paper in there at all. I ruined a good pair of socks getting out of there. Anyway, when uh, I come out here, he was gone. So I come here today and robbed me a bank. Very much bigger I can rob a bank. I usually do stagecoaches and trains, but that bank's standing still. I won't fall off my horse this time. Anyway, I don't know about that bank, though. They shut that thing down last year for seven months, all because of a beer. I thought Corona was pretty good beer. 
<laughs> it's shut down, so I guess I'll rob your bike. Well, yeah, maybe the ass they are. Maybe the bike. Which one should? Bike before you ain't even shaving yet. Well, I've robbed a piggy bank before. Does that count? Piggy bank? Well, yeah. Well, I guess that is a kind of a bank. Sure Here comes is. that fire truck. No. I don't think she's gonna. I don't think she's. That's ours, and I don't think she's in a hurry to get through. She'll. She'll hit her horn if she's in a hurry. You want the proof? She gave me a thumbs up. Just a thumbs up? Okay. Alright! Now now look! Before you go into a town like this, you shouldn't be telling everybody you use a bank robber. Why that? Because you go through that bank door, they all know you're robbing a bank. Now they're going to shoot at you before you can get through there. Yeah, I guess you should have thought of that. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead and give it a try. All I ain't right. seen a good killing in a while. <laughs> he wasn't talking about me, was he? <laughs> well, wait a minute. Must be this right here. Excuse me, I'm robbing the bank. <laughs> <laughs> All the money. All the money. Now give me a go. Come on, you hand it over. Don't make me shoot you. I will. I kid. What? Oh, that's... Yeah, let's go ahead and open up because we got the ambulance right behind. Now, what do you think you're doing with that thing? Oh, well, it says all the money right on it. Figure that's the bank. Well, unless you got one of them little funny cards or some dynamite, you're not getting anything out of that. Well, I ain't got none of that. <laughs> well, then, why don't you go rob the bank like everybody else does? Go inside and rob it. All right. Well, over there. I'm going to go check out the act And don't tell my mama. <laughs> oh, you know you are. You managed to rob yourself. Fine. You better get out of town in a hurry, though. Why? Well, because I went over there to get some saddlebags from that old man. He got upset and went for a shotgun. So I had to shoot him. So they're probably going to be looking for you. Well, why'd you shoot him? Because he went for a shotgun. Over saddlebags? Yeah. Well, yeah, that is kind of funny. That don't make sense. What's in there? Oh, I see what it is now. What? Evidently, he's the one been hoarding all the toilet paper. We ought to be shot. I ought to go steal it. I ought to go steal his sock. Anyway. <laughs> well, now he is officially a bike robber. Well, you know, I guess so. Yeah, that officially makes me a... Uh, what? Bank robber, robber, hand it over. Come on, give it to me. I'll shoot all you. All right, all right. Kid or not, I'll shoot there you. There you go. Want the other bag too? <laughs> Heavy. Heavy? Yeah. Yeah, okay. See you later. <laughs> well, now, wait a minute. Oh, let this be word to you. Don't get a fresh face. Well, let this be a learning to you. What's that? I'm a stranger. Come on, hand it over. <laughs> That other bag, too. <laughs> Give it back. <laughs> All right. Here you go. Want the other bag, too? No, you can keep that. <laughs> oh, I want that one, too. Well, you ain't getting both of them. Oh, I, doubt. I know who you are anyway. Well, where do you know me from? I don't uh, know. Because you're Grizzly Stun, ain't you? Oh, yeah? Yeah. You tell your old man I'm still mad at him. He's the one stole my wife and my horse, and I want my horse back. <laughs> no, I can't do that. We can't do that. Well, as I recall, we done shot your horse. You shot my horse? Well, yeah. What you gonna do a thing like that for? Well, see, we had lots of cold winter. Run out of food. Got the horse and ate it. You 
Eight, my horse? Yeah. That was the fastest horse in the county. Well, you know, I wish you'd have told me that sooner. What's that for? Well, he ran to me in a hurry. <laughs> I can still feel that horse. That wasn't my horse gave you diarrhea. That was her. Her, her cooking. Yeah, she liked to kill me two or three times. You know, I got her from back east as a mail order bride. She wrote me letters for six months telling me how great a cook she was. When I got her to my doorstep, though, I think she must have been talking about her mother because she couldn't even boil water. Yeah, she couldn't cook horse meat neither. Evidently not. Now, you're going to give me that bad gold for killing my horse. I reckon I'm going to keep this bad gold seeing as that cooking like to kill me. Yeah, since I know your old man, I'll give you an even shot. All right, I'll even do the hard way. Well, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? Well, there's all these people hanging around waiting for somebody to get killed. I think they can help. Help? Yeah. Okay, they're going to help. All right. Now, the way y'all's going to help, when we both say we're ready, y'all going to holler, draw. Relax, that way it's fair. Draw. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> What are you doing? Mom, get help. You said you were going to help. Well, that ain't what I make it out of here. Okay, thank you for trying. I didn't even get that kind of help. You didn't think of it. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Is that your mommy giving me the side eye? Yeah. That's your mother giving me the side eye. Hi. 
I know, that's your baby. You're so cute. I want to keep you. Yeah, I do. You're so nice. Yeah. I squat you. I squat you. All right. Bye, guys. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> the baby.